So, if you haven't noticed, we live in a crazy world. I mean crazy. I mean, this, this place is not so, and it's getting crazier by the minute. You're growing up in a time where the Christian West, Western civilization, has largely surrendered to the orcs of insanity. That's where you live. Uh, this comes in the form of people thinking that it's perfectly fine for drag queens to do story hour for little children in their local library. They're living in a time where people think that it's perfectly fine to show pornography and call it sex education. You're living in a time where the government thinks that it can decide whether you are essential or not essential, tell you to stay home, shut your business, stand six feet apart from people, or wear something over your face. Uh, you're living in a time where people think that you can just print free money. And, uh, and so why not print some more? Uh, you're living in a time when somehow Joe Biden got elected. Uh, and you're getting ready to launch into this crazy world as men and women called by Christ to take this world for Christ. So that, that's, that's what you're up against. It's, you know, crazy town. It's like the circus. You know, take it over. Make it normal. Uh, make it please God. You're getting ready to launch into that world. You'll do this in your vocations, your work, uh, taking parts of creation, making it better, making it more glorious, more useful, more helpful to the human race. You'll do this in your families by creating little cultures of Christianity in your homes, by raising children through Christian education. You'll do this through missions work and evangelism and church planting. But if there's been one thing missing from a great deal of Christian engagement over the last number of decades, I would submit to you that it's the missing virtue of courage. Missing virtue of courage. There have been many Christian camps that have come before called. Called is probably the best. But you should know that there have been many other Christian camps, many other Christian worldview camps, many other reformed Christian camps, many conservative political Christian camps, you know, whatever the thing is, there have been many of them over the last number of decades, and those young people, those youth, have gone out into the world, and here we are with drag queens reading to little kids in libraries. Like, that's normal. Like, that's perfectly fine. And so at, at some point, you, you say, well, wh why is this happening? Why is this happening? And the thing that I would submit to you is that despite the many Christian camps, the worldview conferences, uh, and so on, uh, Christian kids have been handed weapon after weapon after weapon to fight the ungodliness and the worldliness with but in many respects, we have never had or had very little courage to fight. So it's one thing to know that weapon kills bad guys. That weapon, that, that, that goes against atheists. That goes against sexual perversion. That goes against that kind of economic insanity. That goes against that kind of political insanity. It's, you can have a whole, whole wall of weapons at your disposal. But it takes courage to actually go pick one up and shoot it at a bad guy. That's, it requires courage. It's not enough to know, like, you know, I can argue this point, that the Bible is the word of God, or that uh, boys are different than girls, or that one man and one woman should get married. Uh, and, and nothing else is marriage. I mean, you can sort of have that understanding, that belief, and say, yeah, that's true, and I can show you a Bible verse, and maybe, I maybe even have heard an argument about it, but it's an entirely different thing to have the courage to engage. Because you know what happens if you shoot at the enemy? They'll shoot back. They'll come at you. 
They'll argue with you. They'll call you names. You might get fired. You might get blocked. You might get canceled. You might have your social media account deleted. They'll shoot back. And it takes courage. Your friends might think you're being extreme. Maybe some people in your church will think you're being extreme. Kind of mean, kind of harsh, not very loving, not very winsome. And so we need courage. In uh, Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but it's the form of every virtue at its testing point which means at the point of its highest reality. So think about all the virtues, Christian virtues, love, joy, honesty, self-control, kindness, mercy, justice. Courage, Lewis suggests, is not simply another one of the virtues. It's the form of every virtue at its testing point. So it's fine to be patient, You know, when the sun is shining, you've had a full breakfast and a cup of coffee. It's easy to be patient. You know when it's hard to be patient? When you missed lunch and you come to dinner and it's it's not your favorite meal at all. It's the worst meal. And your little brother is doing the thing that he always does. and, And it's just, you know, up to here. Okay? Now you need courage. Now you need courage to keep being patient. It's the point at which every virtue is tested. That's where courage is needed. In this sense, courage is necessary not only for the fight, but also for the joy that you need in the midst of the fight, to not grow weary in the fight, to still be happy when they call you names, You need that courage to keep forgiving people when they've wronged you, not just seven times, but 70 times, seven times. You need courage to be gentle when maybe after the third or fourth harsh comment, you're ready to come at them with a machete. (laughs) You need courage so that all those virtues might remain in place, so that you might fight like a Christian. And now from this, I want to to take one step deeper. So courage is sort of the big picture. I want you to walk out of here this morning encouraged. I want you to walk out of here this morning knowing how to pursue courage so that all the tools you receive this week And then as the tools that you continue receiving as you go through high school, as you pursue college, might actually be used. The weapons you receive, you might actually use them. You might not be afraid of using them. So courage, I want you to walk out of here with courage. But there's another step. There's another level below that, I believe. You might remember Nehemiah's charge to the people when they had heard the law read. Remember the people returned back into the land under Nehemiah's leadership. They were resettling the land, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And he read the law, and it, they hadn't heard it apparently in a long time, or, or maybe it just sort of landed on them. They realized how they had broken the law, how God had justly kicked them out of the land. It was, it was from his hand. They didn't deserve to be back in the land. And they just, they just all, like the whole, the, the whole new settlement is just heartbroken. And they're mourning, and they're crying, and they're just, and, and they don't know what to do. And Nehemiah has these famous words in chapter 8. He says, do not mourn, do not weep. And he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, Send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now you've heard that line, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You've seen it on, you know, I don't know, kitten calendars and things like that, and sunsets and waterfalls. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But what is that joy 
that is our strength? What is that joy that is our courage, the ground of our courage, the ground of our strength? What is that joy in the Lord that makes us strong? I mean, frequently, people hear the words about joy, the joy of the Lord. And again, if you sort of associate it with, you know, little puppy dog calendars or things like that, it's, it frequently, Christians even will think, well, that just means sort of feeling good. But that's not what Christian joy is. It's not vague good feelings. It's not some emotional high when you sing that one song and it just, just ooh, it gets to you and maybe you just kind of well up a little bit. No, that's not, that's not Christian joy. It's not some saccharine buzz. It's fundamentally Christian joy is the joy of forgiven sin. Fundamentally, Christian joy is the joy of knowing that your heart is clean, that your, your sins are all forgiven, that you are right with God and the world. It's the joy of having all your sins washed away. That's the joy that gives Christians strength. That's the joy that gives Christians courage. We need that kind of strength. You need that kind of courage, and we don't need any other. What, what is it that's going to make you strong when you've told the truth, maybe when you pulled a friend aside and you confronted them about something, when you refused to go along with some folly, when you called something out? What's going to cause you to stand in that moment? The Bible teaches the thing that's going to make you strong is knowing my sins are all forgiven. I have a clean heart. No, I'm not going to go along with that. Why? Jesus died for my sins. He made me right. He made me clean. That's the joy. And you say, why would I walk out of that? Why would I give up that? I love this joy. I love this light. That's what makes you strong to stand in the midst of the bombardment, in the midst of lies, in the midst of taunting, in the midst of people rejecting you. It's the joy of forgiven sin. We need that. If God is going to be pleased to give us back this land, if God's going to be pleased to give us a generation and multiple generations of young people who grow up and say, I'm not compromising. I'm not, I'm not going to give in. We are, we're going to take this community, this town, this state, this nation for Jesus. If God's going to be pleased to give us this land back, it's only going to be because of this kind of strength, this kind of joy, this kind of courage. And so, how do you get that kind of joy? How do you know that your heart is clean? How do you know you're in that light? How do you have that kind of courage? Well, the Bible tells us. This is from 1 John 1, verses 3 through 9. That which we have seen and heard and declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you, that your joy may be full. So there's, that, there's the joy. You want that joy so that you will be strong, so that you will be courageous, so that you will fight and keep fighting, even when you're tested, even when it's getting hard, so that you will not grow weary in doing good. He says, we're writing these things so that your joy may be full. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and we declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the message that God is light 
That's what he says. This is the message. This is how you can have joy. God is light. Well, that's bad news for people with darkness in their hearts. It's bad news for people with darkness in their lives unless there's a way for that light to drive away our darkness. Darkness and light are kind of like opposites. Right? Are you with me? When you turn the light on, the darkness goes. That's how it works. God is light, and you can't be in his presence with darkness. His light scatters the darkness. And so many simply lie, John notes. A lot of people say, oh, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't have any sin problems. I mean, I, I got baptized. I, I became a Christian. I take communion. I go to a Christian school. I go to a Christian camp called Called. So I, so I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't really struggle with sins really anymore. And John says, you're a liar. You're a liar. Many simply lie and pretend they don't have any sin. That's about as effective as Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes from God. What are you talking about, God? I'm doing just fine over here. John says that there is a way to walk in the light just as he is in the light. There is a way for filthy sinners to walk in the light with him in his light. We can have fellowship with God and one another, he says. We can have clean hearts. We can tell the truth and not be crushed by the light. We can tell the truth about our sin and not be crushed by it. And that is the way of fullness of joy. That's where the fullness of joy comes, is the thing you think that's not possible. If anybody knew what I had done, if anyone found out what I've thought, what I've said, what I've looked at, where I went, what I did, I, I, it would destroy, it would, every, it would ruin everything. And so you, people, Christians even, carry around burdens of guilt and shame, hiding it, trying to hide it, limping along, pretending everything's fine, because if anyone found out, my life would be ruined. No one would, I mean, I would, I would, it, would, it would be horrible, it would be terrible. And you have no joy. And you have no courage. You have no strength, and you're not really helping to fight because you have an enemy in your heart, and you haven't gotten rid of it. You're not getting rid of it. How can you have fullness of joy? How can you confess your sins and it not crush you, it not ruin your life? He says it, by the blood of Jesus, cleansing us from all sin. How do you walk in the light? Through the blood of Jesus cleansing us. How does the blood of Jesus cleanse us? It says, by confessing your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is the only way to fullness of joy. This is the only way to the joy that is our strength. This is the only way to the joy that is our courage that will then give us the strength to fight. So what am I talking about? What kind of darkness are we talking about? I'm talking about your porn problem. I'm talking about your lust. I'm talking about your angry spirit that erupts regularly, maybe out loud. Maybe everyone around you knows you have a short fuse. You get angry, you yell at your sibling, you talk back to your parents. Or maybe it's all kind of under the surface. You don't actually say it out loud, but you're kind of in your heart and under your breath, mumbling and cursing and angry inside. Maybe it's just bitter spirit. You're complaining words. Nothing's good. Nothing's great. You're sort of fussy about it all, complaining about it all. Again, maybe out loud, maybe just with particular friends, maybe just in your heart, smiling, yeah, <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> Hate your guts. You know, bless your heart. That's what they say down south, right? But you have a bad attitude. You hate it. You despise them. 
You imagine not doing it. You imagine not going along with it. You imagine having an argument in which you win. And then I tell them, and then I tell them, and then, all right, yeah, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, yeah. I'm talking about that, that darkness. Or maybe your harsh and critical attitude. You're always, your words are biting other people. Can't believe she does that. She wears that. She does that. He does that. Hi, how you doing? I'm talking about your fornication with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. I'm talking about maybe it's just flirtation with unbelievers at work. You wouldn't actually date them, but it's kind of fun to play around. I'm talking about those sins that maybe haunt you from your past, maybe from when you were younger. Lies you told, tests you cheated on, that guilt that won't let you go, it keeps eating at you. And you stuff it down and it eats at you and you stuff it down and it eats at you and you stuff it down and it eats at you. The fear of being found out, the fear of what might happen if anyone knew. I'm talking about the grudge you have against your dad or your mom or your grandparents. Maybe for real sins. Maybe they wronged you. Maybe they made promises and they didn't keep them. Maybe they got angry. Maybe they were harsh with you. Maybe they really did misunderstand a situation and they treated you wrongly for it. Maybe they sinned against you grievously. And you're raging inside. You're bitter. It eats at you. Maybe it's drunkenness, cutting, using pills or overeating or undereating trying to soothe your pain. I'm talking about homosexual temptation. I'm talking about your envy, your jealousy, your deep resentment of the blessings of God and other people. They, why do they get to have a perfect family? Why can't my dad be like that dad? Why can't my mom be like that mom? Why can't we have a house like that? Why can't we have cars like they do? Why isn't my body like hers or his? Why can't I go to a church like that? All of that is darkness. It's darkness. It's sin. And that darkness keeps you from the joy of the Lord. And that lack of joy is fundamentally a lack of strength and courage. You can't fight God's battles without God's joy. You can't fight God's battles without God's joy. You can't fight God's enemies without God's blessing. And you don't have God's blessing if your heart is not clean. You cannot have God's blessing if you have unconfessed sin in your life. And don't miss the fact that many Christians, of course, in this state... They've got some unconfessed sin, the guilt eats at them, they shove it down, and then what do they do? Because they're feeling bad, they don't want to confess it, that would be a shame, that would be embarrassing, that would be horrible, that would be awful. What do they do? They run out and try to do good Christian things to make up for it. I know, I'll go to called. I know, I'm going to volunteer, I'm going to sing in the choir. I'll join the worship team. I'll help the deacons with mercy ministry. I'll give extra tithes and offerings. I'll go to small group. I'll tuck my shirt in. P people are weird, right? But that's what you're, like, what are you doing? What's driving, and, and like, in, in the midst of feeling bad, and in, in the midst of guilt eating at them, what do they try to do? They try to make up for it. I mean, first of all, that doesn't work. It never works. It doesn't feel better. You don't actually get over the guilt and the shame. It's still there eating at you. And while it's eating at you, you're going out trying to fight, trying to do good, trying to bring God's light to the world, and you're no good at it because you've got darkness in your heart. You're not actually spreading light. You're spreading darkness. You're not actually helping. 
Christians do this all the time. They you know, make some bold conservative Christian post on social media. Maybe they're involved in evangelism or missions. Maybe they go and protest at the abortion clinic. Maybe they're involved in mercy ministry. They go on a missions trip and, and so on. And, but they're not actually helping because they have unconfessed sin. You're not actually bringing light to the world. You're spreading around your insecurity, your darkness. God sees it. You're lying. You're a hypocrite. God doesn't go out with Christians who are not under his blessing. Remember the faithless spies in Numbers 14? Remember the spies went out, they come back, only Joshua and Caleb were like, yeah, it's a big land, big giants, big grapes, we can take it. And the other ten say, there's giants in the land, we're like grasshoppers, we're dead. Let's stay in the desert. And God tells Moses, all right, tell them they get to stay in the desert till they're all dead. And then I'll take Joshua and Caleb and the, re- and the next generation and we'll take the land with them. And they say, oh, no, no, never mind. Hey, we, we just prayed about it and we decided we're going for it. We had a little prayer meeting, we're in, we're down. And, and Moses says, no. You don't want to go now. God, is, God told you this is your deal. You've got to stay. And they said, no, no, we're going. We're going. And they get together a big army and they march in. And what happens? Trounced. Destroyed. And so they were cut down before their enemies. You can't go into battle without the blessing of the Lord. You can't have the blessing of the Lord if you have unconfessed sin. I mean, just think about the, the world we live in again. Why, why are we living in crazy town? Why, why do we live in this, this world where, you know, just turn on the news and, you just, and then turn it right back off real quick? Because, you know, that's, that's crazy land. That's the world. Why are there millions of professing Christians in this land with so little influence? There's like maybe 2 or 3% of our nation's population is LGBT. Maybe two or three percent. With some like 50% of our population ish identifying as Christian. Why are we being chased by them? Deuteronomy 32 says this How should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? Except their rock had sold them, the Lord shut them up. Moses says at the end of Deuteronomy, look, if you find yourself in a situation where one guy is chasing a thousand, you should know that God's not with you. Right? Like, that means God sold you. That means God hates you. (laughs) He's not happy with you. We're like, so why is it that like 1% of our population is chasing us? Because God is not happy with us. He's not pleased with us. We're not under his blessing. Why are thousands of believers chased by one unbeliever? How is it that one unbeliever taunting the church and her Lord causes panic in the armies of God? How is it that one cross-dressing man in a library causes the church to cower and tremble? Well, Deuteronomy 32 says, because the Lord has sold us. God will not go out with us in battle. Why? Why? Because we refuse to tell the truth about our sin. Because fundamentally what we're doing is we're saying, Jesus, you can't handle this sin. I, I, I have to handle this. You, it, if, I, if I confess, it, you know, it would just go wrong. You can't handle this. I have to take this sin. And so God says, okay, you want to fight it yourself? Have at it. Because that's what you're saying when you won't confess your sins. You're saying, I will take care of this sin. I will fight this battle. Jesus, thank you for the cross and stuff. That was really nice, and I might take you up on that at some point. But these things, are, I'm going to have to handle them. And so God says, you're on your own. You said, I'm on my own. And God says, you're on your own. Why is it that a nation full of Christians can't stand against a tiny minority of militant pagans? Because we told God to stay out. We said, we'll do it ourselves. We said, we don't have any sin. No, I'm doing fine. No sins here. Clean heart. 
doing great. Went to church today, feeling great. And God sees through it all and says, you liar, you hypocrite. And meanwhile, of course, you're teaching the world what? Jesus can't handle sin. Right? What are you doing? And what are you leading? What's your, what's your example? Well, I don't really, you know, I just, yeah, I kind of just, you know, I mess up sometimes and just sweep it under the rug. Ta-da. What are you teaching the world? Sweep your sin under the rug. Pretend it's not there. Jesus can't handle it. And the world says, okay. How can we stand against sin in our land if we're hiding sin in our tents? How can we stand against sin in our land if we're hiding sin in our tents? Don't you remember the story of Achan, the man who hid some of the plunder from Jericho in his tent, and then when Israel went out to battle against Ai? I mean, this was, remember, like, they took on Jericho, which is like New York City. You know, a few thousand people, like, marched around New York City, New York City imploded. And then they go to, like, Moscow, Idaho. And they're like, oh, just send out a few tribes. We got them. And then they get their heinies whooped. Why? Because they were hiding sin in the camp. We are in that moment. <laughs> that's us. There's a tiny minority of militant pagans that's trying to drive Christianity out of the land, and we are getting our heinies whooped by a tiny AI. Why? Because there's sin in the camp. Because God won't go with us. Because he won't bless us. But I think in many ways we're actually worse than Israel because Israel only did it once. Like, you know, they went and they got their hineys whooped and then, and then Joshua was like, oh no, God, what do we do? And God says, there's sin in the camp. And he says, all right, we're going to deal with sin. And they kind of go through that whole elimination process where they're narrowing it down, finding out which tribe, which family, which head of household. Oh, it's Achan. What'd you do? I sinned. You're dead. We got rid of the sin. We're worse than, I mean, Israel does it once, and we think, yeah, that was dumb. And we've been doing it for decades. Let's go, let's go protest the abortion clinic again. And they're still murdering babies, decades later. Why will God not bless it? Because we're going out there with sinful hearts. Because we have sin in our families. Because we won't confess our sins. Because we don't have God's blessing. I know, let's pass an amendment that says marriage is just one man and one woman. Yeah, that'll do it. And God says, watch this. The definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Why is our world insane? Because many people in the church taught them. We keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We keep not confessing our sins, telling God, no, no, God, I got that one. I, I got this. I'm going to deal with this my own way. I'm just going to stuff it down. I don't think it bothers me so much. It doesn't hurt. I'm doing fine. I'm feeling good. And God still won't bless us. We have young men given over to lust and pornography we have young women who are mesmerized by worldliness, desperate to be noticed and lusted after. We've lied to our parents. We've cheated in school. We, we have unconfessed sin, and no wonder so many Christian kids are depressed and have so little joy. Why would God bless us in our sin? And how can we bring any light or joy to the world if our hearts are so full of darkness? If you're a true believer in Christ, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have a, a, a new heart from him and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, sin makes you miserable. It's actually one of the, one of the best ways to know you are a Christian. You ever struggle with that? You wonder, am I really a Christian? Am I really born again? Does the Holy Spirit really live inside me? Well, how do you feel with all that sin? How do you feel when you lose your temper? How do you feel when you grumble under your breath? Does the Holy Spirit make you feel sick? 
Do you feel awful? You're a Christian. Or do you sin with impunity? Do you, you lie and cheat and lust and all the things, and, and you're like, I don't feel anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And I would submit to you that you may not know Jesus. You may not be a Christian. Sometimes Christians, of course, can sin so much that they sort of just get numb to it. And you need to start confessing, and all of a sudden some of your, your feelings will come back. But that's one of the signs of regeneration. Psalm 32 says this. David is talking about his experience with sin. He says, when I kept silence, and he didn't confess his sin, when he kept silence, he says, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day. Like his bones ached. He just felt like he was moaning all day long, roaring all day long, feeling awful all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture turned into the drought of summer. That's Psalm 32. God's hand, he says, was heavy on me. He says, I didn't want to confess my sin, and so God's hand was heavy on him, and he felt awful. He felt sick. You know that feeling when you know you're going to throw up? And you're like, no, maybe not. No, no, I'm fine. And like, and, and like, if you're like me, like, I just hate throwing up. And I'll just like, you know, I'll like muscle it. And like, no, I'm not going to throw up. I'm not going to do that. I hate it. And I'll like, I think I just drag it out for like three days. Then just, <laughs> and I'm like, but that's, what is that? It's your immune system. Your immune system is saying, get it out. It's making you sick. It's bad for you. You got a virus. You got something. You got to get it out. You're like, no, I'm just going to shut down. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I'm be fine. And you're not fine. You feel awful. You feel gross. You can't think straight. A true believer knows something's wrong. Everything feels uneasy, sickening. And of course, you can't fight like that. You can't fight God's battles like that. And, and this makes you miserable. You don't feel good. Maybe for a little while you try to put a smile on it, you try to dress it up, I'm doing fine. And you, but you don't. You feel awful. And, and then when you're feeling awful and you're miserable, you make everyone else around you feel miserable. You're sad, you're depressed, you're down, you're whiny, you're fussy, you're irritable. This messes with fellowship. Remember, 1 John says, we have fellowship with one another and with God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. What? Through the blood of Jesus, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. You don't confess your sin, not only do you not have fellowship with God, and not only is God leaning on you, saying, come on, give it up. All right, I can lean harder. You want to feel worse? Okay, here we go. Then it makes you feel miserable with God. You're miserable with the people around you. You have no fellowship. Your fellowship with God is strained. You can't have his blessing on your efforts, and your joy is buried and muffled beneath all your roaring all the day long. But then he says this, and this is in Psalm 32, the next verse. David says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, my iniquity I have not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It goes on. Psalm 32, some more. It says, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when you may be found. It says, Everyone that's godly prays to God. When they know they need him, when they know they need, to, they need forgiveness, they cry out to him. And it says this, Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. And then it says this, you've heard this verse before, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You will compass me about with songs of deliverance. 
Do you want to withstand the floods of many waters? Do you want to be safe from every trouble? Do you want to be armed to the teeth with God's songs of deliverance? When you face your temptations, when you face sin, when you face difficulty and trial, and then not to mention everything around you, do you want to be safe? David says, confess your sins. Cry out to God, confess your sins. He removes your iniquity, removes your sin, and then what are you surrounded with? You're surrounded with songs of deliverance. God becomes your hiding place. He protects you. He defends you. Do you want God to protect you when you face atheists? Do you want God to protect you as you face this world when you go off to college? Do you want God to protect you when your boss says you must address this male coworker as she? Then you must make God your hiding place. You must make God your fortress. Your armor, that's what you're doing when you confess your sins. You're saying, God, I have this enemy in my heart. I have this enemy in my life. Please deliver me. This is a sin. It's evil. Cleanse me. Forgive me. And when you do that, you're making God your hiding place. And God always forgives. And then he surrounds you in the armor of the songs of deliverance. There's no other hiding place except for Christ. There's no other place to hide from your sin except in Christ. There's only Christ crucified for our sins, every single one of them. When you confess your sins, what you find is grace. You find the Father in the parable welcoming you home. Remember that Father in the parable? His son, his younger son, has taken everything, squandered it, prostitutes, drunkenness, comes wandering home. And what does it say about the father? It says he was looking down the road for him. And when he saw him, it says he ran to him. That's how God welcomes you when you come to confess your sins. Luke 15 says, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Who's in the presence of the angels of God full of joy? That's God. Who's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents? God. God is the one Singing and dancing, rejoicing, running. Those, those are the joyful songs of deliverance. And those joyful songs of deliverance are your armored vehicle for the battle. And your goal in your Christian life should be to learn to confess your sins faster and faster. That should be your goal. Learn to confess your sins faster and faster so there's less and less misery. Follow me closely. If sin brings misery, confess it and get back in the joy. Confess it faster. Get more joy. Get more courage. Fight more faithfully. When we sin, we're getting out of our armor. When we sin, we're getting out of our armored vehicle. We're stepping away from the fortress of God's safety. That's what we do when we sin. So I, I've got this God. I know my little brother. He needs me to yell him at him in the face. I'm just going to yell and scream at him. That, that will work, I'm sure. I mean, that, you know, you know, that doesn't work. right? But that's what you're doing when you snap. God, I got this. No, actually, on this one, I'm going to have to lie to mom because she won't understand. God, I got this. No, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit because then my grades and everything in college and parents, you know, God, I got this. You're stepping out of the fortress. You're stepping out of the armor. You're taking off your armor. But when you confess your sins, you're putting the armor back on. When you confess your sins, you make it right. You're putting the armor back on. You're getting back in the armored vehicle. You're getting back in the fortress of God's deliverance. 
If you confess regularly, if you're getting rid of your sin regularly, you can stay there. You know, you kind of step out, ah, nope, never mind, I want to stay right here. And you confess. Sorry, I, I, I did lose my temper. I shouldn't have said that. That was unkind. That was ungracious. I, looked, I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have been, no. And you, and you confess it and you get right back in the fortress. You get right back in the joy. You get right back in the light. But if you let sin grow in your life without confessing, they're like weeds that grow into these gnarly Ugly trees, secret sins inevitably turn into great transgressions. You can't fight with a guilty conscience. Why? Listen to this from Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, talking about Jesus, likewise took part of the same, flesh and blood, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Why are people so afraid? Again, think about courage. Why do people not have courage? Why are people so cowardly? Why are people so afraid? This verse says, it says that Jesus died in order to destroy him that had the power of death, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Fundamentally, the Bible teaches that people are afraid because they're afraid of death. Fear, fundamentally, the sinful kind of fear, the cowardly kind of fear, the fleshly kind of fear, is fear of death. And people are afraid of death because they know they're guilty. You're afraid of the wages of sin, which is death. And Satan is the accuser. The word Satan in Hebrew literally means he accuses. Satan is the accuser. That's what he does. He brings accusations against sinners. And this is why it says the devil had the power of death. How does the devil have the power of the death? Of death. Well, he's the accuser. He brings the charges. You lusted. You lied. You got angry at your mom. You got angry at your little sister. You got angry at your dog. You got, you know, you, you lied, you cheated, you did these things. He brings all the accusations against you, and what? You feel it, and it condemns, and you feel guilty, and you're afraid. You're under the, the con- conviction. You know that you sinned. You know he's right. You know you're not very good. I'm not a very good Christian. I lied. I lusted. I, I, I cheated. I, I got angry. I was so worried. I was so critical. I just, all these things. Satan is the prosecuting attorney and we're guilty. So how did Jesus destroy the devil and the power of death? By dying in our place. By taking the penalty for our guilty verdict. And when he died... Colossians says this, this is Colossians 2, and you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, now how does he do that? By blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He took the accusations of the demons. He took the accusations of the devil, and he nailed them to the cross, and now they're gone, and he triumphed over them. When he nailed the handwriting of ordinances that was against us to his cross, it destroyed the power of the devil. How? Well, the power of the devil is accusation. He says, you did this. He brings up our sins and what they deserve. You lied. You lusted. You deserve to die. You're not a very good person. How do you call yourself a Christian? But there's only one answer to those charges. But it's a really good answer. The blood of Jesus shed for me. Those charges were nailed to the cross of Jesus and he died for them. And so the answer is, yes, I lied. Yes, I lusted. Yes, I was angry. Yes, I was horrible. I was, I was a difficult child. I was a difficult sibling. I was a, difficult, I was a horrible friend. And Jesus died for it. And he got nailed to the cross. And now it's gone. The power of the devil is accusation. He brings up our sins and what they deserve. There's only one answer to those charges, but it is a good one. 
the blood of Jesus shed for me. And when we have that, we can say with Paul, who's sort of this holy defiance, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? What do you got? Bring up anything. What? Anything. Sure, bring up my whole browser history in the internet. Bring it up. Everything I ever thought, everything I ever said, everything I've ever done, bring it up. What do you got on me? Because everything they've got, Jesus died for. If you confess your sins, he died for that, he died for that, he died for that, he died for that. I'm clean. What do you got? Anything else? This is how he disarmed the principalities and powers. This is how he destroyed the power of the devil. He has nothing on you if you're clean in Christ. But if we refuse to confess our sins, we're pretending the devil still has power over us. We are living enslaved to fear. And if you cannot confess your sins, how will you stand up to any evil at all? Refusing to confess your sin is refusing to be courageous. Refusing to be strong in the Lord. Refusing to have a clean heart is refusing to have a brave heart. You cannot have a brave heart unless you have a clean heart. So how do you confess your sins? I'm going to close with this with just a few pointers on how to confess your sins. When you confess your sins, name the sin biblically. What was the sin? Did you lie? Don't just say, sorry about that. You know, all that, yeah, yeah, sorry. Name the sin. I was angry. I lied. I cheated. I stole. Say that you were wrong. I was wrong. God says it was wrong. And then say, will you please forgive me? And then make anything right that needs to be right. Do you need to make up that test? Do you need to return something that was taken? Do you need to tell them the truth? Actually, it wasn't like that. It was like this. I've told this story before, but one time in just shortly after college, at my first job as a teacher, I uh, had a difficulty. I don't even remember the details. I had a difficulty with one of the students, and I called up the mom. And in the course of explaining what happened with the son, uh, or the child, I, I think I... Uh, I don't, even, I don't even remember the details. It was glorious. When you confess your sins, you can't remember anymore. Um, but something about the situation, I think, made me feel like, made me look kind of bad. And so in the process of explaining what happened to the mom, I actually lied partially. I sort of told what happened, but I also kind of covered up part of it. And I hung up the phone, and immediately I just, <laughs> and, what did you do? And I, so I, I got to call her back. I got to make it right. And I, okay, I called her back up. And I proceeded to tell her half the truth. And I hung up and I got a phone. Oh, oh, man, what did I do? And I had to call her back a third time. I'm sorry. This is terribly awkward. I'm an idiot. But here's the whole truth. I, I lied to you again. I am sorry. Please forgive me. It was one of the best things ever for me because that was the most embarrassing thing ever. And it's a great way to clean the system out. <laughs> I do not want to do that again. Confess your sins. Name it. Say you were wrong. Say please forgive me. If you're on the receiving end, of course, of a confession, if you've been sinned against, forgive as you have been forgiven. How have you been forgiven? Much. You can't count that high. Seventy times seven, Jesus says. Don't hold grudges. Remember that refusing to forgive is itself a sin. And also remember this. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a promise. Forgiveness doesn't care how you feel right now. And sometimes when you've been sinned against harshly and it's bad, you really don't want to forgive. You're kind of, it stings. Well, what, when you forgive, when you obey the command to forgive, you promise not to hold it against them. You make a promise. When you, when you say, I'm going to wait until I feel like forgiving, hold up, give me a week or two, I'll tell you how I'm feeling. That's a great way to not feel ever forgiving. But if you make the promise, if you promise to forgive, that's a great way to teach your feelings to come along, and God will bless and, and help you feel forgiving. 
If someone has sinned against you, but has not asked your forgiveness, prepare your forgiveness for them. Sometimes you've been sinned against and they didn't, they didn't see it. They didn't come talk to you. Maybe you even tried to bring it up and they said, I don't know, it just seems kind of like being a little sensitive. Or maybe you've been sinned against badly and they've never come and talked to you about it. Prepare your forgiveness for them. Have forgiveness waiting for them like bread baking in the oven. Just bake it in the oven. It just smells good. Let it permeate your heart. Let it be like a good bottle of wine laid up for when they come. Be like the father looking down the road, expecting them. Your confession of sin should be as public as the sin. If you sinned on Instagram, confess it on Instagram. If you sinned at the dinner table, confess it there to all the people who are there. Talk to the people that were all involved. When you have a garage or a basement you haven't cleaned out for a long time, you might be tempted to just burn the whole thing down, right? Or maybe a closet, you know, just this closet that's full of stuff. But if you're still here, that isn't what God wants you to do. So how do you start cleaning if you haven't been cleaning for a while? Well, here's the trick. Pick up the thing right in front of you. Then pick up the next thing. And try not to look at the whole mess. Just pick one thing at a time. What's the thing that most eats at you? What's the thing that's most in the way of fellowship with God and the people around you? Confess that first. And then ask God to help you see the next thing. Remember when there are big, gnarly sins to deal with, there's almost always a cluster of other, maybe smaller sins around it, often various lies and deception. If you've been sexually impure, have you also been lying about it? That would be another sin to confess. Have you also had a foul mouth? Confess your foul mouth. Have you been dishonoring your parents? Confess dishonoring your parents. The promise in 1 John 1, 9 is actually quite astounding. It says if we confess our sins, the sins we know about, God promises to forgive us for all unrighteousness. That word all should hit you. You say, well, do I have to confess all my sins? All the ones you know about. But if you confess all the sins you know about, God is faithful and just to forgive you from what? All of them. All of them. You confess the sins you know about, and he cleanses you from all of them. It's like the little kid who's out playing in the mud and looks down and suddenly realizes his hands are muddy. He's covered head to toe in mud and says, oh, no, my hands are muddy. And he runs inside and says, Dad, my hands are muddy. And his dad looks at him and says, yeah. And says, I've got a bath for you to make you all clean. Fight for joyful fellowship at all times. Fight for joyful fellowship at all times. Fight for a clean heart at all times, especially in your home, especially with your immediate family. If you're not in fellowship there, you can't share fellowship with anyone, especially those closest to you. Don't say, well, I would confess my sins if she would, if he would, What's the standard? God, how is God forgiving you? Run to confess your sins. Run to forgive. So how can you have courage in the face of the challenges of this world? How can you have joy to stand when no one else will stand? Confess your sins. Put your sins to death. Do you want sin to die out there? then put it to death in your heart first. Sin thrives in the darkness of secrecy, but it dies when it is exposed to the light of the gospel, the light of confession, the light of forgiveness. And if anything in this talk has pricked your conscience and you think, yeah, I do have something to deal with, let me urge you, deal with it right away. Don't say, yeah, when I get home, I definitely gotta take care of that. There's these things called cell phones. Tell your counselor, tell, tell, I, I need to make a call. I need to send a text. I need to send an email. On a break, I, I, need to, I just need at least tell them. I need to meet with them. I need, I need to let them know I, I've got to talk to you about this thing. I, I really got to make it right. Get free. Get clean. Get back in the joy. Get back in the light so you can get back into the fight. When you see your sin dead on the battlefield, you realize nothing can stand against the light of this gospel. It's just sin. 
It's just sin. And if Jesus can deal with your sin, then he can deal with all the sin out there. If he can, he can deal with your darkness, he can deal with all the darkness out there. And you realize that you will be able to stand against any darkness because the light you have shines brighter than all of it and you won't be afraid of anyone or anything anymore. Father, I pray that you would bless these students this week. I pray in particular that you would set them free from all sin, all darkness, all bondage to fear. I pray, Father, that whatever sins are lingering, whatever guilt or shame is clinging to anyone in this room, I pray, Father, that your spirit would uh, be heavy upon them, giving them the courage to put it to death, to confess it, to name it rightly, to ask your forgiveness, to get clean, to make it right, so that they can get back into the joy, get back in the light, get back their courage, get back into the battle. And I pray that you would bless them, bless them now, and bless them in the years to come. In Jesus' name, amen.